5 o'clock, we begin tonight with a bit of good news on the COVID front. In Oregon, cases are down slightly and vaccinations are up a bit. It's not a huge change, but it is clear things are heading in the right direction. Here's KGW's Pat Doris. As the fall sports season began, many gathered for big football games or soccer matches with tens of thousands of others, all proving vaccination to get inside. Have you noticed? No major COVID outbreaks as a result. An advisor to the Oregon Health Authority said that shows it is relatively safe. Yeah, it does show that, you know, the fact that you're vaccinated and that you are masked during these activities is actually very protective and will limit the number of cases. A check of the most recent numbers available from the state is encouraging. The number of people infected for the week ending October 3rd hit 10,400. That's a lot of sick folks, but the count is actually down nearly 9% from the week before, and it's the fifth week in a row that the numbers have dropped. Hospitalizations, 462 people, 50 fewer than the week before, an 11% drop. And vaccinations, on October 6th, the seven-day average was 10,173 shots per day. That's up slightly from the week before, but it's way up from mid-January when the number was closer to 5,500 per day. I was also wondering how much the the mandates may have played a role. You know, the mandates play a significant role. I think uh, or mostly Oregonians do listen to the governor and understand that we're doing this out of concern about public health. He also thinks more families are getting vaccinated as they send their kids back to school. And here in Multnomah County, schools are open and pretty much operating without any major problems. Could it all change and get worse in the winter months? Sure, it could, but let's hope not. In Northeast Portland, Pat Doris, KGW News. Yes, let's hope not. A bar in Medford is doing its part to help people get vaccinated. Jefferson Spirits will host a shot for shot event this weekend. It's on for tomorrow. People who get the vaccine will get a gift certificate for food or drinks. Dennis Clark is the owner. He says the event is not intended to start a debate about getting the vaccine. All it is intended to do is offer a place. If somebody wants to come here instead of a drive through parking lot, they can come here and have a little smile and fun afterwards. Clark says they're offering the Johnson & Johnson one-shot vaccine. Around 29,000 people in Jackson County need to get a vaccine to reach the 80% threshold. That's by far the most in the entire state. The installation of Portland's newest bridge will have a major impact on weekend traffic. A six mile stretch of I-84 will close tonight for the work. The bridge won't open for months and right now there are lines of large homeless camps on either end. Will they be cleared before bikes and pedestrians start using it? Well, Chris McGinnis took a look. Staged alongside the Banfield, Portland's latest piece of bike infrastructure, the Earl Blumenauer Bridge, will slide into place atop Interstate 84 this weekend. So we will have about six cranes operating throughout this uh, weekend, getting that bridge in place over the freeway safely. Which means I-84 will be close to all traffic eastbound from I-5 to Cesar Chavez and westbound will be closed from I-205 all the way to I-5. That closure runs from 10 p.m. Friday until as late as 5 a.m. Monday. Additionally, ODOT plans to take advantage of the closure by doing some maintenance work along I-84, like bridge inspections and graffiti removal. But generally, it's been pretty peaceful and uh, respectful. What's going on? Philip works at an art dealership a half a block to the south of the new bike bridge. There are homeless camps on both sides of the new bridge in the shadows of the construction. I go off to work in the morning and then I'll come back in the evening and, you know, they're trying to earn a living the best they can in the situation they're in. The city has no plans to move the houseless. Those camps at this time have, are not interfering with our construction. They're outside of our work zone, and so uh, that's just not a focus of ours at this time. The $13.7 million project is funded through transportation system development charges and the Oregon Convention Center Urban Renewal Area. It's a weird situation. Um, how do you... How do you designate funds for one thing, but then there's lacking in funds for another thing? The city broke ground on the bridge in November 2019. Delays this year, Peabot says, were caused by trying to coordinate a time to close I-84. Even though the major span will be in place this weekend, there are months of work to be done, 
The opening of the Earl Blumenauer Bridge is expected sometime next summer. Chris McGinnis, KGW News. A judge has rejected a request from Oregon State troopers to halt Oregon's COVID vaccine mandate. 33 troopers had sued to temporarily stop it, but the judge ruled that the state does have the power to enact public health laws, even if they, quote, may have the effect of curtailing individual rights. The judge also said that Governor Brown is acting within her legislative authority. The mandate requires all executive branch state employees, including troopers, to be fully vaccinated by October 18th. It also applies to many health care and education workers. Complaints about cars, trucks and RVs parked on Portland streets continue to rise. A KGW investigation found in the first seven months of this year, Portland residents filed more than 3,800 complaints with the city about abandoned vehicles, illegally parked cars and debris in the roadway. That's a 107% increase from the same period last year. But there is an alternative. Several cities, including Vancouver, have created safe parking spaces so people living in their cars or RVs have a safe and legal place to stay. Vancouver's safe parking zone, set up at an old C-Tran bus transit center, holds about 50 cars, RVs and trailers. There are portable toilets, hand washing stations and garbage cleanup. It's, it's hard to try to transition from trying to find a job and then just leaving your stuff out there because Potentially it's either going to get towed or it's going to get ripped off or it's going to get broken into. Later tonight, KGW investigative reporter Kylie Boshi explores how these safe parking spaces can help alleviate some of the stress between neighbors yeah, mine's, and people mine's parked mine's on their the street. Pocket, you can watch this report tonight at six right o'clock on the story. Homelessness is not just an issue in the metro area. Community leaders in Grants Pass are coming together to find or try and figure out a solution. Grants Pass could soon be get its own urban campground. The city will partner with All Care Community Foundation to take on the project. Sam Engel volunteers for the foundation. He hopes the project will be up and running by January. There's a will to do it now. Uh, the need has been here for a long time. This is everybody's problem. Uh, housing and homelessness and poverty in our community is something that affects everyone. A location hasn't been selected for the campground yet. A similar urban campground opened in Medford last year. Tonight we are learning more about the massive fire in southeast Portland, the one that destroyed four businesses. The fire burned for hours and sent two firefighters to the hospital with minor injuries. Christelle Kumwe joins us live near southeast Hawthorne and 14th Avenue. Christelle, you talk with the battalion chief today who was there. Correct, Laurel. So Battalion Chief Dustin Miller was on scene on Tuesday when the fire broke out at the commercial building right behind me on Tuesday. And as we mentioned, he said those two firefighters that were injured have now fully recovered. And that is quite remarkable when you see this video. The firefighters were blown back to the street by this smoke explosion. Battalion Chief Miller says they don't often see this kind of hostile fire event. What changed there was how rapidly uh, the fire progressed through the building. So when you see that video, all of that smoke and that fire that pushes out of the building was very violent and it was very quick. Uh, and when it happens like that, we uh, are usually unable to react quick enough to it. There was nobody inside the businesses at the time of the fire and no other injuries except the firefighters. And now the investigators tell me they are investigating what caused the fire. But as of right now, the battalion chief tells me they are not quite sure how long that could potentially take. Dan? Christelle, thank you. You're right. That was a remarkable video. Glad everyone's feeling better. A Klamath Falls man who was on the Amtrak train that derailed in Montana last month is suing Amtrak. Justin Ruddell says that he was walking to the bathroom when the train jolted and veered onto its side. He was headed to Chicago from Chicago to Klamath Falls. The crash killed three people and at least seven others were hospitalized. I thought I was going to die in the shock and panic. Somehow through the sheer will to survive, I was able to climb out of there. Had I not held on as tightly as I could, I would have been crushed by the train. Volunteers were able to get Ruddell into an ambulance. He did suffer some injuries, two broken vertebrae in his back and five broken ribs. The law firm he's working with says it's representing a handful of passengers who were on that train. 